Without further delay, I would like to welcome Ron for his first. All, all the applause. Uh, well, Carl is a great friend. Where is Carl? Oh, sitting way in the back. Great friend, taught me a lot. I reflected on that last night during the dinner, so I don't want to do too much more today. Uh, let me begin by saying note on this, the collaborators on this talk, because sometimes they don't get mentioned during the talk, and I would not have been able to do whatever little we have done without them. Uh, let me begin with a few pictures. Whoops. Uh, so when I was in uh, Madison visiting uh, Madison, you know, Carl was really busy, but he always invited me over to dinner at his house, at least once a week. And he cooked the dinner, you don't remember this, with your boys. Yes, and not only did you cook a dinner, but most frequently dessert. And quite uh, good desserts, extraordinary desserts. He, he learned different recipes and cooked desserts. Well, this isn't a dinner from when... Uh, when I was looking for, for slides and you know you can't, whenever you need them you can't find them. But I found this slide which I thought is kind of interesting because look at Carol's eyes there. Right? <laughs> look at his eyes. Now, doesn't there say that there's some devil, devil in there <laughs> behind his eyes? You, you wonder, right? And this is Walter Rudin and Mary Allen Rudin, but do you know the other people, Carol? Yeah, yeah. Okay, and at, at one of the uh, great times we had together with Carl was they had a, uh, con uh, a, a conference in China. It was 86, 85. 85. And uh, we were there for a couple weeks and had a lot of dinners and everything. One dinner we had was at the Great Hall uh, where Nixon and... Uh, uh, had dinner with Kissinger and all that at, at the Great Hall with Peking Duck and all. This is not from the, the Great Hall, no. I did, couldn't find a picture from the Great Hall. But when we had dinner at the Great Hall, we had dinner with the Minister of Education, with the President of Beijing University, with the head of the Young People's Communist Party, etc. You know, big shots in China. And uh, Maybe you don't know, but these people are good drinkers. They like to drink. They're very strong at drinking. So there was a lot of this uh, gambe. Gambe, yeah. Like that, gambe. Every gambe, Carl would gambe with them. So <laughs> Carl is very strong at gambe. Well, with, also that uh, little old man who kept drinking my Yeah. <laughs> so... So I don't know. Now this is another dinner, but he has a three up there. I don't know whether this is the third uh, of his drinks or what the three meant, but uh, it could very well have been that this is number three on the way to ten, because he, he was very strong at drinking. And this is another picture taken in China, I think, on, on this trip. Uh, okay, so this was at my 60th birthday. And the reason I bring this one out, because Carl was a very strong drinker, but now we can look at the spectrum. Here in the, in the background of Larry Shoemaker, he's imbibing. But this guy here, you see, you notice what he has in front of him? It's not alcohol, right? It's fruit juice. This is Wolfgang. Where's Wolfgang? Yeah, yeah. So this is common of Wolfgang. If you could get... Wolfgang to drink more than one beer, this is an accomplishment, right? Typically one beer is his limit, and then he, he goes for the juice. On the other hand, is we have this guy here. Look at this guy. Now look, he looks like he's wasted already, right? I mean, you know, if you saw him at a bar somewhere, you would say, stay away from this guy, because, you know, who would... Anyway, this is Amos. Where, where is it? Is Amos? Yeah, Amos is here. Okay. So uh, this was at my <coughs> 60th birthday. Now, oh, this is uh, Carl with his great friend, the great friend, George W. 
So Carl, you know, got the Medal of Science, which is very rare in the United States. The number of mathematicians who got this is very, very small. And uh, I was at the uh, ceremony, I'll get to that in a minute, but this is, uh, I look for the, on the web they have the picture where uh, President Bush puts the medal on you, but when you try to download this picture, it's some, something else. That would have been a better picture. But Carol always complained about George W. That why did I have to get you know the Medal of Honor from this guy? But now Carol, but now Carol, look, it could have been worse, right? <laughs> so you see, it's all relative, huh? The new guy has all the good numbers. Putting the Actually, he said, <laughs> famous last words, huh? Okay, so I was invited to the dinner that uh, took place with this. Now, at the dinner it was very formal, so you had to have a tuxedo, and I had a serious de decision to make because to rent a tuxedo is like one third of the cost of buying the tuxedo. So you have to decide, do I rent or do I buy? And I thought, well, you know, I'll probably have the opportunity to go lots of times wear this tuxedo. So I bought the tuxedo, but I've never used it again. <laughs> but this is me in the tuxedo with Eitan Tadmore. So we took this picture before we went over. Eitan was my guest at this uh, reception for the Medal of Science. So those are good memories. I have thousands more. Carl, you're great. You're my best friend, and I, and I really appreciate you. OK, so now I segue into the talk itself. Uh, so what I want to talk about is a very uh, common uh, problem where we're given some data about an unknown function f. So f is unknown to us, but we get this data, finite amount of data. And we want to answer some question about f or uh, uh, approximate f, so we think of this as a problem of fitting the data. And my interest will be to emphasize whether the methods we put forward, the algorithms we put forward, are in some sense optimal, and also whether we can certify before we begin uh, that we can achieve a certain accuracy, guarantee an accuracy. So for guys in the industrial area, pay attention. OK. All right. So uh, you can think of whatever applications you're interested in that your data came from any of these applications. It's what I'm talking about is very generic. OK, so there are two types of tasks one typically is confronted with. One I call prediction, which you will be asked for uh, later that you'll be given another uh, value of the variable x, and you're interested in evaluating f at x. I call this prediction. And so in this case, you really want a full approximation to the function f. A second, more limited uh, problem is that you're, you have a quantity of interest. So you're not necessarily interested in recovering all of f, the full recovery of f, but just answering some question, like what's an integral of f, or what's the maximum of f, uh, you know, what's the temperature at this place, or, or it, it, you know, behind the wing, or whatever. And so I want to uh, look at uh, algorithms for answering these two types of questions. This I call full approximation. This I call quantity of interest. You would think before you begin that you should be able to do better for quantity of interest, right? Because you're asking for less. So given your computational budget, you should be able to accomplish more. OK. So we can make this a mathematical problem. And uh, here is the setting. <laughs> so I start out by discussing the full approximation problem. So first of all, I have to tell you, what is the data? Well, I'm going to assume in this talk that the data is given by linear functionals applied to f, like point values of f, or in the case of MRIs, line integrals, or integrals of f. So that's the form of the data. I don't allow nonlinear measurements in, the, in this talk. 
So the measurements are finite, there are m of them, and we have this measurement map that takes f, applies these linear functionals, and gives you these m numbers, w1 through wm. So that's this measurement map. <coughs> now, I'm talking about the full approximation problem, so how would I measure the performance of a given algorithm? So any algorithm is a mapping that takes the data and maps it back into whatever Banach space I'm working in. So I need a way to measure error in how well I'm doing, so I'm trying to approximate f, and so I measure the error between f and the approximant that I create by this norm, norm x, this Banach space. And we can do this for a variety of Banach spaces. Okay, and then given that way of measuring the error and given an algorithm which is a mapping into x, the error for a given f, this is a pointwise error for a given f, is the difference between f and the approximate that I've assigned. I've taken m of f, the measurements, applied my algorithm, and I get this function in x which is the approximate to f, and this is the pointwise error. Okay. Now, if you look and say, oh, okay, I want to find the best algorithm for this problem, or somebody comes into your office and they say, oh, I have this data, and tell me what to do, you immediately figure out you can't tell him anything unless he gives you more information about the function that gave rise to the data. Because if he doesn't give you any information, the error could be just as bad as the norm of f, that you could take zero as the approximation. This is easy to show that you can't do any better than that. <laughs> so to state a meaningful problem, mathematical problem, you need to insert some additional information about f. Right? Do you all agree? You can't, I mean, if you're not giving any more information, you can't do anything. This additional information we refer to as model classes. Also in statistics, one refers to this as a model class. So these are the additional assumptions we make about f. So we assume that f is in some compact set k contained in our Banach space. So k is, is, is a compact set. And uh, of course, the more we know about this k, the better. So some engineer comes into your office and they say they have this problem and you start to quiz them and say, well, w wait a minute, where did this f come from? You need to know something about the function you're trying to capture. And typically in this problem, uh, one inserts model classes that are of the following two types. One, uh, the deterministic model classes. There are stochastic varieties of this problem. I'm going to talk strictly about the deterministic uh, problem here. Uh, but the typical uh, model classes are ba based on smoothness, like Lipschitz, assuming that the function has so many uh, derivatives or, or, and bounds on the derivatives, or in the case of uh, signal processing, that this, the, the function is band-limited, right? The spectrum is contained in a certain interval or something. And in high dimensions, this is now a little less clear what should be the model classes in high dimensions, but uh, typically we go for things like uh, sparsity or compressibility, anisotropy, variable reduction, things like that. This is not as well settled as in the <coughs> low dimensional case. So this identification of what the model class is very central to this uh, problem, and the more you can say about the model class, the better. Sometimes in scientific computation, uh, it's possible to derive results on a model class. For example, if you know that what you're trying to capture is the solution to a PDE, maybe you can prove a regularity theorem for the PDE and there derive some properties of the, the solution. Uh, in other settings, it's not so clear, and so one of the things we would like to do is to develop algorithms that work and are optimal or near optimal for a wide variety of model classes, so that you don't need to know the model class before you begin. You can use this algorithm in a universal type of way. Okay, now once you fix the model class, this 
problem, uh, by the way, which is called optimal recovery and was very popular in the 70s. And uh, one should note uh, people like Alan probably worked on it. And Charlie, Charlie, definitely Charlie, Ted Rivlin, Joe Jerome. Uh, there are a lot of people that uh, worked on it and did very elegant results on optimal recovery. Huh? Oh yeah, in the, in the IBC community. So there are certain general principles, and I'm going to explain these to you about what an optimal algorithm is. Okay, so you're given uh, K and this norm, and you get your measurements W, and you have all these functions that satisfy the measurements and come from K, right? That's what you know about F. It comes from K and satisfies the measurement. So this is a subset of K, right? You slice through K in some sense. <clears throat> and the error in your algorithm, of course, is, is as I stated before, F minus AW. And the worst case error, so this is a pointwise error that is given W. This is the error knowing the measurement W. Sometimes you're interested in the error where you don't know W, where you take the soup over all W, because you don't know in advance what W will be. Okay, so this is the error on the class for your given algorithm, and the optimal performance would be to find the best algorithm to minimize this, this error. And the best algorithm is called the optimal recovery, I'll denote it by A star, and it has a simple description that given uh, this set KW, so that's all you know about F is, is that it lies in KW. Find the smallest ball that contains KW. I have a graphic in a minute to, to explain this. But you find the smallest ball that contains KW, and the center of that ball is the best you can do in terms of a, a, an approximation. So the mapping of W to the center of this so-called Chebyshev ball is the best algorithm. And the best performance is the radius of this ball. So let's go to the graphic in case you missed it. So here's my set K, and I say that I, I have the measurements W, so that carves out a small portion of K. Pictorially looks like this pink area almost. Looks just like this pink area here. And that's what I know about F. It lies in, in, in KW. So the best I could do as an approximation is to take the center of this ball, the smallest ball that contains KW. That's the best I could do in the approximation problem. And uh, in the case of uh, where I have a quantity of interest, something similar happens. Now you apply this Q, this quantity of interest, and you get a set of, well, depending on what Q is, it could be a set of numbers or a set of vectors and you take the, 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 the smallest, uh, the center of the smallest ball that contains Q of KW. But in any case, the Chebyshev ball, the, small, the radius of that ball is the best that you can do. Voila! You may think, oh great, I know how to solve this problem. <laughs> let's go home and let's start drinking that wine Carl and I like to drink there in Bonn. But the problem is, uh, it's not so easy to find this Chebyshev ball. In fact, you look at all these papers by Rivlin and Michelli and all these guys, the problem is in a given setting, find this Chebyshev ball, find a center, find the, uh, the best algorithm, estimate the radius of the ball, and so on. So this is not so easy to, to accomplish. Now, what I want to point out is, it seems to me, that there's a very natural model class or model classes for this problem. And in, for these model classes, we can solve everything exactly. So now your only objection, so I'm going to solve everything exactly, tell you everything you want to know, optimal algorithms, a priori estimates for performance and everything. The only thing you can argue with me about is these model classes, I'm going to tell you, these are the model classes to look at. You may say, oh, I don't like your model classes. But I want to tell you, you're wrong not to like my model classes. And here's the model classes. And here's my rationale for these model classes. If you're going to create some algorithm, 
you're going to take the data and you're going to create a function in your Banach space that you think approximates f, right? So you have some approximation procedure, right? Given the data, you, you, you create an approximation. And you're, you're thinking, why are you using? You use splines, right? This is what you, you would use, splines or wavelets or what? Or, or neural networks, right? Deep learning, everybody wants to do deep learning. So you choose this method and you must think that the function f you're trying to capture can be approximated well by this method, right? Otherwise, why the hell are you using it, right? If you're using splines and splines are lousy for this problem, why are you doing that? Find some better approximation tool to use in the approximation. So I advocate the following model classes. I, I say, okay, let's suppose V is the space of functions that we're using to do the approximation. This can be a linear space of dimension n, but it could be nonlinear, like free knot splines or uh, neural nets with so many nodes whatever you like. So V does not have to be a linear space, but it's what you use to do the approximation. And the way I classify F or the model class is to say F can be approximated with some accuracy epsilon. This is what I know about F. It's, it's, somehow it can be well approximated. Now you can argue you won't know epsilon and I don't need to know epsilon. And what I do further, I don't need to know epsilon. I need to know the V that you think is good but I don't need to know epsilon, okay? So don't worry about the fact that there's an epsilon here and I don't know epsilon. It can be any epsilon. <clears throat> and I'll give you a result. So this is the model class I'm gonna choose for, for K, right? As the model class to describe the Fs. And F is a, a function that can be well approximated or can be approximated by, by this procedure V to a certain accuracy. You in agreement? You understand? Do you object? Not yet. Okay. So far. Okay, hundred percent. So far. So far. Okay. So I say if you if you accept this, I tell you the best algorithm, I'll tell you the performance. What more can you ask for, right? So here's the to to understand what the best algorithm is, I have to introduce this mu of N V. This is a number, mu. And this is a very important number seems to be neglected in this field. But it's a very important number, and if it looks a little confusing to you, don't worry, you'll learn to love mu, right? Like that in that movie where Peter Sellers drops the bomb and he, he learned to love the bomb, right? You'll learn to love mu. So what is mu? Well, first of all, look at the null space of this map. So if you take a function and, and you apply measurements to it and you get zero, what the heck are you going to do as an approximation? You're going to take zero as the approximation, right? Or do you have something more clever to do? <laughs> well, M is a linear map. <clears throat> well, I don't know what you mean by skewed, but it's a linear map. It's, it's, a, it's a linear map. And look, any guy with measurement zero is going to be approximated to accuracy the norm of this guy. So look at this mu. It's the soup of how big can the norm of something in an all space be, still satisfying the fact that its distance to your space V is, is whatever it is, the epsilon. Okay, so take and normalize so the, the distance of eta to v is one, how big can the norm uh, of eta be? You're not going to overcome this mu because these are functions who, whose measurements are zero and all these functions have the same measurement zero. They all have to be approximated by one function. I think the zero function, although I almost seems to want to argue with me about that. And the best you're going to be able to do is this if the distance is one, right? Mu is the best you can approximate all these functions that have measurement zero, given that the distance of eta to v is one. All right, so mu is important. And here's the answer to the, the problem, that if you take this set k epsilon v, 
remember these are the functions whose distance to V is less than or equal to epsilon. The best you can do in recovering this set K is mu times epsilon. Now epsilon is natural to appear here because you're assuming that the function F can be approximated by order epsilon. So you, your dream was that you would actually recover it to accuracy epsilon, right? But to ac recover it to accuracy epsilon, you would need to know the full information about the function. And you don't have it. You only have these measurements. And mu is the price you pay for having this partial information. <clears throat> so this is the, the error. This is the best you can do. You can go and work on this for years. You're not going to do better than this. I say there's something nice in this formula because the mu sort of tells you how good these measurements are. If mu is big, it means you have lousy measurements. You know, it can happen, right? You're given crappy measurements. It'll be reflected in this mu being large. So this is for a Hilbert space. In the Bonnock space, there's a slight change. You have to go to mu to two mu on the bottom and is squashed between these two. Don't, don't worry about that slight difference. It's due to the geometry of the Bonnock space. And of course, the worst case are what? L infinity and L1. Right? These extreme cases where uh, uh, these Bonnock spaces, the unit ball of the Bonnock space. Okay. Uh, I'll give you the example of the uh, Hilbert space. So I haven't told you what the optimal algorithm is. Now the optimal algorithm is not going to be a surprise to you. Okay? You're going to say, I came all this way to Singapore, thousands of miles, and he tells me this. I'm terribly disappointed. I want a refund. What is, what is the optimal algorithm? You take your data, W, and you look at all V in your space V, and you look to, to minimize W minus MV. You want the measurements of V to match the measurements W that you're given in the L2 norm. What is this? This is least squares, right? This is least squares fitting. I almost just gave a course in it. None of the students understood what he was talking about, but this is what he was talking about, right? Okay, now if you look at the mapping that takes W into V star, this closest element from V in this sense of matching the data, this is not quite the best algorithm, but very close. It's a near best algorithm. It's within a constant two of the best algorithm. To get the best algorithm, you have to do a slight adjustment. You have to take V star, move it to something. See, V star won't satisfy the measurements. You, you make an adjustment. I, I have a picture on the next slide that'll help you, a cartoon image. But accept this for now that the, the, the best algorithm is essentially least squares, right? Everybody does least squares. I mean, if somebody comes in, the first thing they do is least squares. And you say, why the hell are you doing least squares? I mean, what, what is there in least squares that's so great? But how often do you see this measurement mu <coughs> this is the performance. Do you see this measurement written in books? I looked in books and I don't see this mu appearing. <coughs> and then you ask people on this and they give you some answer. Oh, yeah, 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 we sort of knew. I mean, but it seems to me this is the first thing you should do. Do you prove this in your class? Almost that the performance of least squares is this mu times epsilon? Of course. Of course you do. I have a question. This is the second in the, the last display. Here? It's, it's the, the, the E is bounded by two and uh, the, yeah. last display, the last display. This? Where is E star now? What happened to E star? <coughs> it should be star. It should be star. Yeah, yeah sure. They're the best algorithm. Anything more on this slide? So, so the least squares performance is mu times epsilon. That's the error in least squares performance. And it seems to me that should be explicitly stated. That this is the a priori estimate you have for performance. Because you do least squares, you should know what the error you're getting, right? And, and this displays for you the effect of the bad data. If the data is bad, mu will be bad, and this estimate will that I had on the previous page will not be good. So here's a pictorial to describe what's happening. Okay, So uh, this is our space V, which I have to draw as one-dimensional. 
Our set k epsilon is a cylinder, right? It's all functions whose distance from v is less than epsilon. So it's a cylinder of radius epsilon about v. W, these are my measurements, and I take my measurement w, and I move up, right? I look at all, fu all functions that have the same measurements, w. That's this red line. The red line actually keeps going up, right? Down to infinity, up to infinity. These are all guys that have these measurements. These are guys that are parallel to the null space, right? The atom, and they have the same measurements. When you move up, you puncture the cylinder. You enter the cylinder, you exit the cylinder. Then the best you can do, the best radius, I mean, the, the information you have, kw, is that it's on this red line. kw is this red line. The best you can do is the center of the red line. The v star, that's this best least squares approximation. You see you make this slight adjustment to get over to the red line. And that's the best you can do. Okay. <clears throat> Uh, this same thing holds in any Banach space. It doesn't have to be a Hilbert space. I, I wanted to do a quick example here. Suppose that we're in a space C of uh, D. D is some domain in RD. Where our measurements are point values. What is mu? Mu is the, the following. Mu can always be co computed, by the way. In all practical applications, don't think that mu is some nebulous quantity. I don't even have any idea what it is. It can be computed. Mu is this ratio. So in this case, it would be the ratio of the norm of V. V is, think of V as a polynomial, for example. It's the norm of the polynomial divided by the discrete norm of the polynomial. The discrete norm, because I'm making measurements at these points x1 through xn, and I say, what is the maximum value there? This is always a number bigger than 1, right? And if I have bad measurements, for example, if the xj's were all cornered together in some small part of the domain, the norm of p could be very big, whereas the, the norm of p on this discrete set is very small. And the mu would be big. So this would be an indication that you have bad measurements. You with me, Carl? Yeah. By the way, apologies to Alexei, who has heard this talk before. Okay. So take an example. Suppose we wanted to approximate a function on an interval by polynomials. Okay, We're given the values of f at some points, equally spaced. I take them equally spaced. doesn't matter what they are, but I take them equally spaced. We have m points, and our job is to approximate f. What should we do with these, these values? Well, we need, to, uh, we need to compute this mu. We need to have an understanding of this mu. Well, this mu turns out to grow in a, <coughs> what is capital N? Probably capital N is, uh, oh, this should be M. This should be little m. That is, if, this, if you chose uh, the degree of the polynomials to be the number of points, what you would be doing is interpolating, right? If you interpolate at equally spaced points, the Lebesgue constant is exponential. This Lebesgue constant is the mu in this case, all right? So this is bad. What happens is if, if you choose the degree of the polynomials to be like square root of m, then the mu is actually bounded. The mu is, becomes bounded. You can prove this by Bernstein's inequality or uh, Markov's inequality. The mu is bounded. And so for, the, for this choice, if you chose to, to do uh, least squares with uh, polynomials of degree m, your error estimate would be this exponential a to the m times the distance of f to polynomials of degree m. And you better have a very analytic function in order for this d distance of f to polynomials to be exponentially decreasing to kill this a to the m. However, if you use polynomials of degree square root of m, you get this estimate. And in this estimate, the mu here is very nice. And this, of course, is always going to 0. 
So what does this illustrate? Of course, we don't know whether f is real nice and x, you know, analytic or exponent or kind of rough. So we don't know really what to do here without some extra information. But this is analogous to this problem of overfitting data in learning theory, where you learn you don't fit all the points of the data, you only fit a portion of the points of the data. Okay, <clears throat> so uh, computing mu tells you what overfit means. All right, high dimension. So how, how uh, where's uh, Zwei? How, how, how careful are we with time? I mean, do you, you want to stick exactly to the time or what, what is the deal? I should finish at 10.30? Yeah, okay, I, I, because you are so great, I'll give you five more minutes. What does that mean? What time do I finish? 10.35. Oh, great, okay. Well, but I, I, I just mentioned in high dimension, the problem is what are the model classes in high dimension? I, I don't want to spend my time on this, but uh, this was for people that were doing neural networks and deep learning and, you know, deep learning is this catch-all. Everybody says deep learning. Everybody writes a paper on deep learning and nobody knows what deep learning is doing, right? <clears throat> What's lacking in deep learning is to understand what model classes does deep learning do well. What, you know, what functions do they approximate well, these neural networks? Uh, okay, I wanted to make some remarks before I go to the quantity of interest. What I did here so far, the, the Hilbert space case was done in this paper. Wolfgang is in the audience. Uh, Bonnock space was done in this paper. And I want to mention that there are closely related works by these guys, Alexei is in the audience. Uh, they, they emphasize uh, computational complexity, uh, stability of the computation more than the error of approximation, but they're related and one should uh, look at those papers. Okay. <clears throat> uh, I want to, here's an interesting question that remains uh, in somewhat open. So you have a Bonnock space, you have all this, we know optimal algorithms, right? We know this optimal algorithm, which is to map us into the center of this Chebyshev ball. In the case of the Hilbert space, we have a very explicit description of it. In the case of general Bonnock spaces, sometimes we have explicit descriptions of it. But here's the general question. Is there a linear? Is, is the optimal algorithm linear? Or can you give a linear algorithm that is optimal? In a general Bonnock space. In a Hilbert space, it's clear. What's Smolyak's lemma? What's that? Ah, Smolyak's lemma is for quantities of interest, linear functionals. Linear functionals, these are operators. This is full approximation. And they're related. But you can't go from linear functionals to operators so easily. So this is an open question. In a Hilbert space, it's clear. In the case of uh, C of omega and point values, you can prove this and you use this Kalman's convention. Do you know Kalman's convention? You probably do, or Carl does. Kalman is uh, sort of a partition. You're given these points and you want to tessellate, or what, what do you call it, where you make, uh, yeah, you make regions and you have partitions of unity on these regions, and that's what Kalman does. It doesn't quite work to do this problem, but you massage it some, and you can then prove that you can build linear algorithms that do the approximation in the case of C of D, in the case where point, the measurements were point values. But in general, if I give you a problem, I don't know whether the algorithms are linear, and there's a bunch of questions you could ask if you're interested in this. <clears throat> By the way, we talk, I, I stuck this in because people were talking about quasi interpolants So I mentioned that <clears throat> Uh, how do you build linear algorithms? Well, one way to build them is by quasi-interpolants. Because what I mentioned before, this Kalman business, of proving there exists a linear algorithm, which, by the way, matches Smolyak and Osipenko, their arguments are not constructive. They're functional analytic. So here, as well, what I mentioned, that there exists a linear algorithm, is not constructive for the case of C and point values. So can you construct an algorithm? 
And to construct an algorithm, you can via quasi-interpolants. So what do, what do I mean by quasi-interpolants? Uh, I mean that it's a, a linear operator that it uh, maps everything into some space, but it preserves V. So it maps everything into a bigger space, right? But it preserves V. You may think of uh, polynomials. So, it, you know, if you take polynomials of degree n and you do interpolation, the Lebesgue constant is horrible. However, you can build an operator that maps <coughs> into polynomials of degree 2n that preserves polynomials of degree n. And now the norm of this operator is reasonable, like 2, right? I call such operators quasi-interpolants. You always have them. The question is, how big do you have to make this super space that contains your space V? So you're given V and you want to build some bigger space. You're going to map into this bigger space. It's going to preserve V. How big does this bigger space have to be in order to have a nice bounded map? Well, you can always do it, but the question is, how big does it have to be? But whenever you have such a space V, you can build this operator, uh, the, uh, an approximation operator to solve the previous problem, uh, which is linear. Okay? So that's a constructive way to build the operator. The, the, the question is, how big do I, in a given concrete situation, do I have to build it? In the case of splines, this is, is it what we actually do in splines? <coughs> Yeah, in splines, you just try to preserve polynomials, so you don't try to preserve the whole space of splines. But anyways, maybe this is some abuse of notation to call these quasi-interpolants, but that's what I mean. Okay, so you may not have understood this slide, but uh, you can ask me afterwards. I want to now spend the last few minutes talking about quantities of interest, because up till now I talked about full approximation. I wanted to approximate F. Suppose <coughs> I have a quantity of interest. Now you think you should be able to do better, right? Because you have less to do. You have to only approximate Q of F, not all of F. All right. So I want to tell you that the theory goes almost the same. What happens is that mu that we had, that mu gets replaced by this mu, which depends on Q. Remember, before mu had the norm of eta, now I only have the action of Q on eta. So, you know, when, you, when, you, when you're listening to a talk, you have a filter, right? The filter, a lot of times the filter cuts off after five minutes, right? You say, my God, I, where's my paper? I want to read, uh, I'll do something else. Don't worry about this. There is a mu that depends on Q, determines everything, okay? And I will get back to mu in, in, in a moment. But in any case, the performance of optimal operators is completely known. Squash between this mu times epsilon and 2 mu times epsilon. The point is that this mu, which is defined here, which you have no feeling for, perhaps, but that mu is smaller than the usual mu. Because the usual mu has norm of eta, but q, I'm taking here q as a, a, a linear functional, by the way. I haven't explained that. I want to take q as a linear functional of norm 1, so this will always be less than norm of eta. So this mu is smaller than the old mu, the mu for the full approximation problem. Okay. So the performance bound is better. You have a question. I want Q to, to be a linear functional, but it's not one of the measurement functionals. I have these measurement functionals. Now somebody comes with a new Q. <coughs> oh, because in the general context, it can be linear but not mapping into R. It could be a linear map into Rd or something. Yeah, it could be a vector value map. It, it can be more general, but, you know, just to get the ideas out. Okay? So this is mu. Dick Varga used to give a talk. And the first thing he would do is he'd define something called nu. And then five minutes later he'd say, Sherm, what's nu? 
And Sherman would sit there and think, he means what's happening or what? But he, no, no, Nu is there on the right hand side. This is Mu. What's Mu? This is Mu. Okay? Huh? Oh, and that's how they got it. That's how he got it. Okay, well, you know, I haven't heard from Dick for five years or so, but he's, I think, still around. Yeah. <coughs> You've heard from him recent? Oh, his wife passed away. Uh, yeah, I can imagine. I'm sorry to hear that. Okay, uh, what I want to tell you about quantities of interest and this relates to what Alan was saying, that there always are linear maps that are optimal. This goes back to Smolyak and Ossipenko. Ossipenko must have been a student of Smolyak, because Smolyak never wrote this down, right? But Ossipenko wrote it down. <laughs> yeah, Ossipenko, I think, was a student of Smolyak, and he wrote this down in a paper. And he proves that there are linear algorithms by some convexity theorem in functional analysis. You take tangents to the convex hall of dead blah. Okay, so what? But it doesn't give you the algorithm. What I want to point out here that there is actually a numerical way to achieve the best algorithm. So if you have a quantity of interest, if you're in a Bonnock space, if you have a space V, let's say, is linear, then I can give you a numerical procedure to create the best algorithm. And here it is. The numerical procedure says, look, this is what you have. You have Q, and what you want to look at is for certain linear functionals. What is a linear functional? It should be a linear combination of your data functionals, right? Your algorithm is going to take your data and do something to it. So you take the data functionals, the LJs, you take a linear combination, and naturally, you just try to fit Q as well as you can, you would think. However, you have the caveat that you require that the linear functionals you use to try to fit Q agree with Q completely on V. Right? You have your space V and you say that it's like quadrature. You know how we could create quadrature? We take polynomials and we say we want to a quadrature formula that integrates polynomials exactly, right? This is quite similar. We want to find a linear functional that matches Q exactly on V, but does the best at approximating in the dual norm. Okay, so now, can you do this? <coughs> and the answer is yes, you can numerically do it. Uh, I will explain this on the next slide. And you get this performance estimate. So I'm now per, we, we already know a performance estimate with mu, right? So why am I telling you something different? Because this will illustrate a little bit what's going on. So this number now that I put here is bigger than mu. Has to be bigger because mu is the best I can do. But this number I put here is reminiscent of what we do in PDEs, right? With elliptic PDEs, this Ronecker stuff. You have a product of two things. You have a product of how well you can approximate the solution to the PDE and how well you can approximate the adjoint problem. The adjoint problem is this Q. So this is an estimate. But by the way, it's not always the best estimate. I don't want to get into that, but it's not always the best estimate. But it is an estimate. The best estimate is mu. And mu can be smaller than this. Okay, so you're completely lost, but you say, I have no, nothing else to do this morning. I might as well just sit here and I'm thinking about something else. But, okay. Uh, I, I want to give you one example and, and, and then I'll show something. So the example is quadrature. So quadrature, you know, especially interesting in high dimensions. What do you do with quadrature? You know, how, how do you build something that integrates well, given data? Well, usually, you know, people talk about Monte Carlo and quasi-Monte Carlo, 
in, that, in those cases, you're generating the measurement points. I'm looking at a different problem. Like a lot of times people say to me, oh, I don't quite understand your, your talk. I mean, why don't you do compressed sensing? Compressed sensing allows you the luxury of picking where you do the measurements. I don't allow you to pick. You have the MRI machine. You have to take the measurements from that machine. Compressed sensing says, oh, I'll build a new machine. Okay, go ahead. I'm saying take the old machine. Are we doing the best with the measurements from the old machine? That's what kind of question I'm answering. So in numerical integration, I'm assuming that the, the data is given to me. I don't have choice. Carl wrote a paper on cadre. Cadre, right? But in that case, you've got to pick the next points or not. Your quadrature. It was adaptive. You got to pick. Yeah. So my problem is somebody comes into your office, they give you the data. They say, I have this data, I want to compute the integral. What should I do? Well, the worst thing to do is just to add up the values and divide by one, and the number, or whatever, or, or do something like that. It's not the best algorithm. The best algorithm is <coughs> as follows. Okay, so we're given point values. We want to compute an integral, maybe with a weight. What do we do? Well, the theory that I presented to you says that the best algorithm will take the form of taking your data, multiplying it by some numbers, and adding them together. How do we find these numbers, AJ star? Well, AJ star solves this minimization problem. You minimize the L1 norm, it turns out, if you try to figure it out. You minimize the L1 norm. You look at all sequences, look at their L1 norm. The requirement on the sequence is that it agrees on your space V, gives you exact integration on V, and you try to minimize this norm. That's the best algorithm. And so this can be solved by constrained minimization. Now, how long it takes you to solve it depends on, on, on the person you talk to. If you talk to Stan Osher or Emmanuel Candes, eh, it's trivial. We say, oh, oh, seconds we solve it, you know. And then you put your students to program it, and they say it doesn't work. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so do you do L1 minimization all the time? Is it fast? Yeah, it depends. <laughs> okay, do you do it? You'll find the best algorithm here. Okay, now, ah, now I want to talk about some, something with a little bit of fun to it because we know the best thing to do. Given data, we know the best algorithm with the caveat that on the model class, right? All this says that if you know that the model class, the thing you know about the functions you're trying to capture, is they can be approximated by the space V well, then we tell you the best you can do. So I became interested, well, what do, what do people in computing global temperatures, what do they do? Oh my God, try to figure this out. So we read the papers. I'm going to tell you, uh, okay, one approach to this problem. So you're trying to, the quantity of interest is the integral of the temperature, Txt, is the temperature at position x at time t on the Earth. And you integrate over the whole Earth, and you integrate over a given year, that's a global yearly temperature, right? You may be interested in regions, you may be interested in daily temperatures, you may be interested in other things, but I, I, I want to restrict my attention to one thing as I do the talk. Okay, so you say, well, what's the data? Well, there's stations throughout the world. Here they're pictured in blue. I think there's 17,000, I mean, it's either 17 or 30, but there's a lot of stations, right? <clears throat> they're concentrated in the United States and in Europe. And you're worried that there's not much down in here, right? Now, if you're if you're thinking in terms of mu, like I am, I'm thinking, uh-uh, there's going to be a bad mu with this. Because I have this data is pushed into certain regions, not everywhere. So I'm kind of concerned. Okay. So, you know, this problem is not ripe 
for the mathematical analysis for several reasons. I want to tell you that. One reason is you don't have data that has used the same station for the last 40 years and has measured the temperature every hour, et cetera, and then here, here's the data. No, it's a mess. Sometimes the station's working, sometimes it's no longer working, they've replaced it with another station. So the data doesn't fit the mathematical model that I'm always doing the same thing over and over again. If I'm always measuring at the same positions, I know the optimal solution. But if, I, if you start changing the solution, every time you change the positions, I have to find a new optimal solution, right? Okay, so that's a, a part of the problem. However, there's a, a certain number of stations that have stayed operative for a long period of time, and we could just use the data from those stations. All right. All right, what should we use to do the approximation? Well, Carl would be ha happy to know that what they're actually doing, NASA and all these other agencies that do it, use some sort of splines. Exactly what they're doing, I'll try to explain, but something to do with splines. I'm going to propose as an alternative spherical harmonics. I'm not saying that I know for sure the temperature function is smooth and so we should use spherical harmonics. That has to be proven, maybe through some theorems about PDEs. But let me explain what they do now. So this is what all the, if you read a paper on this, this is roughly what they're doing. <clears throat> okay. So they first, they measure what they call surface air temperature. That means they have a thermometer sticking above the ground a little bit, and they measure the temperature at, at that position. So that's the starting point. Then they look at the data and they say, hey, some things don't look right, you know. Edmonton, it says 40 degrees centigrade. We know that's not right. Let's throw that out, right? So they do some massaging of the data by looking at anomalies. Huh? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Then they do. Then they say, uh, "Wait a minute. You know, in in cities, it's actually warmer than the air temperature because buildings are holding temperature, temperature, and all that." So they decide to make some adjustment. They take their data and they add one degree. So, so somebody decides in some office somewhere. I don't know who this is. The king of king of temperatures decides what to assign. All right, then they turn to the main vehicle that they're going to, how they're going to do the temperature. They would like to take the grid, the, the sphere, flatten it out, right, make a big uh, rectangular uh, thing, and grid it, and assign a temperature to every grid point, and then use splines to do the integrate, integration. Okay, that's what they want to do. So they have the job of how do I assign a point, a temperature to each grid point. So I take a grid point and I look around. Are there measurement stations nearby? I take the closest one and I average somehow. But this is not mathematically tight in the sense that they say, here's the formula, how I decide how to assign that temperature. So it's impossible for me to make this a mathematical algorithm. But in the end, what they're doing is they're taking the, the data and they're approximating the function t by piecewise polynomials and then integrating the piecewise polynomial. But I can't tightly say exactly how they're doing it. Okay, okay, so we do it with spherical harmonics, SH6. That means the degree of the spherical harmonics is 6. All right? Globally. Yeah, globally. And you may argue, you know, that's bad because the temperature over here in Philadelphia is, for, is affecting the temperature in uh, blah, blah, blah. But I'm interested in a global quantity. I'm not interested in the temperature in, Phil in uh, Manila uh, itself. I'm interested in total global temperature integrating. So it's not so bad as you first thought, Carol. Okay. What you see here is uh, <coughs> their temperature computations, and ours are not too far apart. 
ours are sort of consistently below theirs. And why that is is because of these adjustments they make to the data. They seem to be wanting to make adjustments to raise the temperature, seems to me. Uh, okay, so that's six, that's nine. Okay, they match pretty closely. Now the main point I want to draw about this is the mu. Because they compute something and they say this is the global temperature. How the heck would I know that this is the global temperature? They, you know, take the data, do something and give you a number. How would you ever justify that this is the global temperature? Now if you take and you believe my model that the temperature function can be approximated well by spherical harmonics, now I can say something. I can say that the computation that I do has an error which, remember the mu, is mu times how well I can approximate the function, the epsilon. Right? So I have to be cautious about the growth of mu that is overfitting the data. That is, you know, uh, taking mu so large, I improve the approximation, obviously, by increasing, uh, excuse me, taking the degree of the spherical harmonic so large, I increase the pro approximation error, sure enough. But the fact that I have a fixed set of data, I increase the mu. I have this competition between increasing the error and increasing mu. And what I see is that as I increase, so 9 is still reasonably well. That's why we use 9. But if I go to 12 or something, now the mu is big. So if I compute something and I have, you know, I, if I make an error of less, a half a degree, and I'm using 12, then the, the total error is uh, 12 degrees off. It's a tremendous error. It makes no sense, okay? So there is a role here for mu in trying to analyze what this does. Okay, this is the last slide. I went, I'm almost sticking right to your plan. So what I tried to tell you is that uh, there's a way to talk about optimal algorithms for uh, solving problems of data assimilation. They require you to have a good model class. I've proposed that the model class should be built on some form of approximation. Uh, the challenge in applications is to, in fact, agree that this is the correct model class in a given application. Not easy to, to agree upon, so you try to extract as much information about the particular uh, model class to, to do this. But beware that there is this mu sitting in the background that tells you whether the data that you're receiving is compatible, is good data or bad data. Okay, thanks a lot for the talk, and happy birthday, Carl. Talk too long. Michael. Yeah, so, so I mean, what, what you're telling me is quite reasonable. There's uh, so, some, some kind of interaction between uh, uh, the size of, of, let's say, the space in which you reconstruct and, and the number of measurements. Because also the position of and, the measurement. And the position, yeah. But, but, but uh, let, let's say if you take certain, uh, um, let's say, wavelets, you could have like infinite number of functions and you have finite number of measurements. Would that work with your analysis, or will you end up with a mu that? Mu is always infinite. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Mu is always infinite because I can build the linear combination of the wavelets that vanishes at all the data points that you've chosen, and you're integrating that guy to be zero, but I can make it anything you want. That's the problem. If you take uh, the space V to be too large, you can find a function in V which vanishes at all the data, and the function is non-trivial. Multiply that function by any constant alpha, it still satisfies the zero data, and its norm can be huge. So, so mu is infinite. So you need to understand mu and learn to love mu. Yeah. We spent a lot of time thinking about mu, Wolfgang and I. But as soon as you regularize the problem, 
that regularize the changes. And usually you really don't know how much you have changed it. Maybe you put on a regularizer that changes the nature of, of the problem very much. So the, there is no regularizer in here in that respect. And therefore, the, number, the space from which you recover has always been mentioned at most the number of right. And in, in, in a way, this emphasizes the need for very good reduced models, because the very good reduced models give, give you a high accuracy with few degrees of freedom. So that is, that is has a yeah. huge context of interrelated results. Any further comments? If you're not the same, wrong again. <laughs> <laughs>